Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, Opportunities on Our Doorstep. I'm Raj Kandola, uh, Head of Policy at the Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce. I'd like to welcome you all to today's event. Uh, next slide, please, Grace. So this event itself is part of a wider uh, campaign we're in called the Festival of Business, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, essentially, what we're looking to do is showcase the fantastic opportunities which are um, open across the various regions and areas that we represent as a chamber. I know it's been a very tough 18 months, but it's great to see there's so many exciting projects which are, are going on right now. And this week's all been all about Solihull. And as we know in Solihull, lots of exciting projects going on, whether that's the construction of HS2, uh, the transformation of UK Central, and of course, uh, the um, impending arrival of the Commonwealth Games, which is taking place next year. So from our perspective, what we're really keen to do, to do today is just talk about some of these opportunities, what it means for local businesses and how they can get involved. And I'm delighted that we're joined by Michael Dyke, MD of Balfour BT Vinci, playing a key role in the construction of HS2. Claire Barker, the head of communications and engagement at the Urban Growth Company, playing a key role in the transformation of UK Central. Uh, Nicola Turner, MBE, director of legacy at Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. And Alison McGrory, um, Associate Director at Solihull uh, Council, who will talk about the uh, impact of the Games and what it means for Solihull and the wider region. Now, in terms of an agenda for today, so very shortly I'll hand over to the speakers. Once we've heard from all of our speakers, we will uh, have around about 15 minutes or so for an audience Q&A. Um, and we should be finished by around 12.30. Again, if there's any questions that you'd like to ask, uh, then please do um, uh, put them in the chat box. Uh, we've got the Q&A function there. If you have any technical queries, then please do uh, leave a message in the chat box and my colleague Grace will try to pick those up. And all that's left for me to say before I hand over to Michael is a big thank you to our sponsors, Aston University and Leap IT. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand over to Michael. Thank you very much, Raj, and uh, good morning to everyone. And thank you for having me today, uh, representing Balfour BT, Vinci, and also HS2. Um, just a little bit of context, if I may. Um, I've um, been running uh, what effectively is BBV since um, uh, May of last year, and um, therefore we are but uh, just over one year young in terms of our, um, our growth um, in the local area. And um, we're going to be around for uh, at least five to six years, and we hope for much longer um, as more phases of um, HS2 become built out. So what I'd like to do today really is, is hopefully talk to some of those things that I, I anticipate are going to be of interest to you. Um, and in particular, um, to get into um, a conversation around um, SMEs accessing BBV, jobs, numbers of jobs and types of jobs and the roles, and indeed how we intend to actually communicate that beyond just today and the sort of timescales that you can expect to be able to um, see that further information over. So Grace, if you wouldn't mind clicking to the next slide, please. So I'm sure we're all familiar with High Speed 2 and um, for the avoidance of doubt to remind everyone on this call that the primary purposes of HS2 is, is what we describe as the three C's. And the three C's uh, mean that we're all about connectivity, um, in other words, connecting up parts of the UK that otherwise um, were not as accessible previously. Uh, carbon, um, and clearly HS2 plays a very important part for UK PLC in the zero uh, carbon by 2050 um, push. And capacity is the third C, given the fact that I think all of us have recognised, um, perhaps in, in times gone by, um, pre-pandemic, um, often how it would feel when trying to um, access um, trains and to access seats and so on. So therefore talking to those three things, connectivity, carbon and capacity. And um, I, it's my pleasure and privilege on behalf of Alpha Beta Vinci to bring a big chunk of that to life in what is the vibrant um, heartland of England. So if we can click to the next slide, please, Grace. Um, two things, left hand side first. Um, HS2 is broken up into a number of manageable parts and uh, BBV, Alpha Beta Vinci, are building the largest single part of High Speed 2. And it's not only the largest part by length, um, which is just over 90 kilometres from Southam here at the bottom end of Warwickshire, up into Curzon Street and then looping back out onto the West Coast Main Line near Fradley. Um, it's also the most complex part of the route. Uh, complex because we cross multiple terrains and geographies. 
and we um, dive deep into the heart of, uh, of a highly urbanised um, location in the form of Curzon Street in Birmingham. So with that being the case, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a real beautiful engineering challenge for us, but actually what you'll see on the right hand side is reference to our blueprint. And the important thing to note from our blueprint is that our blueprint is, is an intended document, which is a bit like a compass that we use each and every day. And we've had a lot of positivity within our organisation um, to actually give our people the clarity and the purpose that they need to play their best shots um, on behalf of the UK taxpayer, but also on behalf of um, local um, residents and stakeholders and the like. And the mantras that I use time and again are that we have to be safe and well we must be a good neighbour and we must deliver value. So the blueprint, which is in the public domain, um, you can access that and you can get a flavour as to how we set ourselves up for success. But most importantly, we are here to do two things. One is we're here to build a railway for the future to service those three Cs. But secondly, we're here actually to make a difference and to leave a healthy, positive legacy, particularly when it comes to skills, employment and education, which I'll come on to shortly. So it's, it's a sort of multiple, um, a multiple uh, outcome that we're seeking to achieve, but uh, building a railway is not enough. Um, but I would emphasize that building a railway does require unique skills, capabilities and, and mindsets, which I'll come on to later when we think about um, how people can access our world and play their part too. Next slide, please, Grace. Just to give an idea of scale, um, I think, there's no way other than to describe what we're doing as, as immense. Um, immense in terms of size and scale. And whilst on the page there, you can look at lots of statistics and facts and what have you. Um, if I maybe just picked one of those out um, by exception, and that would relate to the volume of concrete. <clears throat> and if we think about the volume of concrete at 1.8 million cubic meters, if I were to say to the audience today that um, the approximate volume of concrete that went into the whole of Wembley National Stadium or for our French colleagues, Stade de France, it's about 100,000 cubic meters, which means that effectively between the bottom end of Warwickshire up into Curzon Street and beyond to uh, Staffordshire, Balfour Bitti Vinci will be skillfully and carefully deploying 18 Wembley National Stadiums, whilst also integrating all of the moving parts that go with that, ready to receive track and rail systems. So it just gives you a scale of the undertaking. It is nothing short of enormous. And as I move along that line to the right-hand side, the cut and fill of more than 30 million cubic meters is um, is quite a logistical challenge to say the least um, and to do that in a way that um, causes minimal disruption and disturbance is is simply our mantra as to how we have to operate but the scale um, cannot be underestimated next slide please grace um, we turn to skills, employment, and education. Um, over the life of this program at PEAK, we will have created something between seven and 8,000 direct jobs. Um, and when I say direct, um, that breaks down really into two categories. Category one is in relation to the um, number of staff. And uh, at PEAK, we will have about 2,000 staff. So I'm not particularly keen on the phrase, but in old money, um, that would tend to relate to white collar office based staff. Um, and then beyond that, circa five to 6,000 um, field-based um, roles and tasks um, of a blue-collar nature. So it's a big undertaking, and um, we're actually at a stage where today we now have in excess of 1,000 staff, um, and we have several hundred people working on the ground. But we are still in startup mode. Um, we've taken the last 12 months to mobilise. Uh, resources to set up um, our locations which will be completed over the course of this summer um, and we are now putting in place the infrastructure necessary to get ready for the main event which is building a railway um, but what's really important to us when I talk about um, building a railway is we do actually have some hard deliverables um, which are of the non-railway type which is in relation to apprentices uh, work, dealing with worklessness and also careers in education so what you can see there is that uh, Balfour Beatty Vinci will create 400 new apprentices, uh, apprenticeships, should I say, um, which represents about 5% of the workforce. Um, and um, that can come through a combination of routes, um, whether it be apprentices in the traditional sense, as one would have known them before, ranging through to modern apprenticeships, T-levels and all, all other routes to form those opportunities for people to access our world and most importantly, to access a career in what we do. Um, worklessness, again, we are working very, very hard to create work placements and to ensure that um, 
skills training work, tri work trials and unemployed graduates have the ability to return into the workplace with Balfour BT Vinci to actually, if anything, um, reset themselves and to get back on a path um, to employment for the long term. And then above and beyond that, we also have careers and educations where through a combination of things that we are doing through local alliances and associations and colleges and, and the like, we are actually playing our part in actually developing specific career paths and education opportunities as well. And that's just really a, a small fraction, I think, of, um, of what we're here to do. But um, when, we, when we consider that obligation, it's not something for me that is something that is in the background. It's something that's absolutely front of mind for me, as well as building a railway. And therefore, it comes as no great surprise that for some of you that may uh, know a lady called Shilpi Akbar, uh, Shilpi reports directly to myself and Shilpi's specific responsibility at my top table is to ensure that in building our railway, we meet these commitments and these obligations. There's a way that High Speed 2 actually hold us to account, um, which is absolutely right. And um, for each one of these things that we deliver, we accrue a point and each point is then factored into the um, top level um, amount of investment we will be making um, across the entire line of route. And I'm pleased to report that in our first year, we actually are running at twice the level that we need to be at. Now, that isn't to say we will continue to run at twice the level and we will generate 800 apprentices. Um, but at the same time, what we are doing is trying to get up that curve early, get people in early and actually make sure that as and when our workload ramps, which is an enormous workload you'll have seen previously from the previous slide, uh, to make sure that we are ready and match fit. Uh, next slide, please, Grace. And the sort of opportunities that, um, that really emerge for us um, relate in a number of areas. Um, creative services, um, which maybe is sometimes the, the less obvious things when you think about an organization such as ours, which has an engineering objective, um, but all self-explanatory stuff, food and catering, accommodation, services, transport and logistics, of which we have an enormous requirement up and down the line. Uh, trade and construction, obviously, and site services ranging from cleaning um, right the way through to supplies of PPE and everything else. And I think what I wanted to do today, most importantly, is to um, ensure that um, the message is there that uh, what we want to help you to be aware of, and most importantly, wider society, um, as to what it takes to become match fit to play your part within Balfour Beatty's Finch's endeavor over the coming years. And, um, you know, we very simply have this aspiration um, to deliver on the skills legacy whilst also creating jobs along the way. Um, and clearly we are a construction engineering organization, but I hope you can see from the slide in front of us now um, that that leads to an enormous amount of other opportunities as well, um, not just the pure construction type. Next slide, please, Grace. Now to become um, part of the world of Vinci and Balfour BT, um, there's a, a number of simple steps that I would advocate people follow. And to a greater or lesser extent, we've had um, some healthy take up um, in each of these areas um, as we move through the process of identifying organizations that have an interest working with us and that we believe um, can work with us because we're building a railway and building a railway has some very stringent standards. Um, it has stringent standards because nothing can be wrong. We have to get everything right first time, which means that we are stringent in terms of the original um, entry point. Um, but the original entry point is to basically register with the Supply Chain Sustainability School, which you'll see at the bottom of your slide there. Um, Compete for um, on the left hand side is an online portal that enables us to advertise contract opportunities to the supply chain and enables the supply chain to register an interest in tendering for a particular package within Balfour BT Vinci. And it is free to register for that um, particular portal. Um, the pre-qualification process um, starts to then move um, prospective suppliers through the process of having an interest to being capable and validated to be able to play your part and their part in our world. Um, so construction line um, is something that I'm sure is known to many of you and um, to those that are in purely, purely in the construction industry, but it goes much wider than just pure construction, um, uh, is, is a requirement that we have whereby organisations must be accredited and registered 
with construction line, but I know in a former life, having done it myself, it's not an overly arduous process. It's relatively straightforward to do, and it's not particularly time consuming either. Um, but it is an important next plank in the pre-qualification process that we use. And then we round that off with something called Jagger, which is an e-procurement tool that we use to manage our tendering activities. And again, this is easy to register. It's fair, it's transparent, and it is an efficient process. So I think with that being the case, and I'm sure there may be questions beyond uh, this presentation today and indeed um, in the fullness of time, but these are the essential planks that um, uh, supply chain uh, partners must connect into in order to play their part within Balfour BT and Vinci. If we can now move to the next slide, please, Grace. Um, and we have a number of channels, and I guess one might say that what we're doing today is, is actually putting ourselves out there because I have a very, a very deeply held belief that we need to be welcomed by our presence, not noted by our absence. So for that reason, um, we want to make sure we're taking the opportunity through um, engagements such as this to be able to connect with a wide church of people in order to make sure that we are visible and present and accessible rather than appearing to be operating in the shadows. So we have a number of things that we have already done and will continue to do throughout this year and beyond, ranging from um, effectively business readiness um, round tables, business groups, innovation events, meet the contractor events, and many, many other things too. And um, you'll see up to the top right-hand corner that in 2021, my um, target that I've set to the team is to ensure that when we think about our spend, as it were, um, and our commitment to um, local jobs and the like, we should be targeting 30% SME and 30% local. Now, I have some information which is hot off the press so only earlier this week, which um, advises me that um, of the 203 awards that we have made um, as Balfour Vici Vinci since starting up last, um, last April, um, we have made 40, 48 local awards, um, which represents 24% of that total. And we've also um, awarded uh, 46 um, SME awards. Now, some of those overlap because some are both local and SMEs, some are not. But essentially, about a quarter of the awards that we have made to date um, are um, both local and SME based. Now, as I'm sure you can appreciate, um, when we think about local, uh, local can uh, relate to um, large, uh, larger organisations which are not purely local, which have a local presence, but ultimately in trying to tackle the challenge of creating jobs and leaving a lasting legacy, I'm fairly certain to know that if larger organisations or global organisations are operating locally, they will be employing local people to a very large extent. So I think where we're comfortable in terms of the direction of travel, we're clear about where we want to go. But one of the things that we're very keen to do is to move through to the end of this year at our 30 30 percent targets but then to drive that higher in future years um the final thing i'd like to round off with um and you might be thinking to yourself what exactly is it that will be coming our way and when and how do those opportunities arise and when will we know them um we're presently in the process of creating something which we describe as a blueprint for external consumption so when uh, we showed you the imagery before that was our blueprint which is an internal um blueprint which clearly is in the public domain but it's primarily geared at our people understanding how they play their part to deliver a railway and to meet all of our other obligations and the way that we want people to behave particularly about being a good neighbor um, so the blueprint for external consumption will be effectively an evolution of that but it will be very much focused around being more specific about dates um, activities and types of work and physical areas where we will be so it would be fairly reasonable for me to say to you in the next three months, so by early autumn, we will be putting that on the streets. We'll be very happy to share it and any number of forums. And most importantly, it's a constant live accessible document online and it will give people access as to our program, our activities and um, indeed our intentions. So with that being the case, I shall um, pause now and I'm going to hand back to Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. And really, as you know, the Chamber of Big Support of HS2 have been since inception. And we look forward to working with yourselves over the next few years to ensure that uh, local businesses are primed to secure those opportunities. Um, now, we've had a message from uh, Nicola's team saying, unfortunately, she won't be able to join us uh, this morning. So um, what we'll do 
Claire, if it's okay, we'll, 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 we'll hand over to yourself. And then Alison, if you come in after Claire, and that'll give us a bit more time to run through um, Q&A. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions that um, Alison can pick up around the Commonwealth Games as well. So um, Claire, can I bring yourself in now, please? Sure. Good morning. Um, thank you, Raj. Um, thanks, Michael, as well. The, the running order is very appropriate, really, because much of what I'm going to talk about is a result of HS2's arrival in the region. So um, the, the, the point of my um, presentation today really isn't so much to talk about the direct job opportunities or the contract opportunities, but it's more about generating a sense of sort of um, enthusiasm and excitement and pride in, in what's happening in this particular part of um, Sully Hall and the West Midlands really, just so that the, the people on the call can, can see what this picture is like that we're painting so that in 10, 15, 20 years time, the investments that we're all making now, you're going to realise the benefits of those investments. So um, I understand that colleagues from Sully Hall Council have, have been on the festival earlier in the week and have talked more broadly about UK Central and how that's delivering across the borough. Um, but for the next 10 minutes or so, I want to just zone in really on an area called the hub. So if Grace, you could pull up the first slide, please. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Sully Hall, this, this ought to make some sense, but I'll just very briefly explain the area that we refer to as the hub, which is part of the wider UK central area. So you can see these, these five constituent parts, really. Um, you've got Jaguar Land Rover to the um, southwest corner. Uh, Birmingham Airport and the NEC are either side of Birmingham International Station, which is on the West Coast Main Line that you can see running um, through the centre of the site. To the very north, the yellow triangle is Birmingham Business Park. And then as you move across that um, visual, <coughs> excuse me, the blue triangle is the Arden Cross site. And this is home to HS2, which is where the majority of Michael's work will be um, carried out over a, a number of years. Um, next slide, please, Grace. Thank you. So what you've got here are, are two images that at a glance don't look very different. Um, but if Grace, you're able to sort of toggle between this and the next slide backwards and forwards, what you can see is the difference between how the hub is now um, and how we see it developing over the next sort of 10, 15 years, really. Um, Arden Cross is the main site for development and you can see an awful lot of mixed use development springing up there with HS2 station at the very heart of it. But what you can also see are the NEC's plans for um, the master plan ambitions that they've got there to make much better use of some of the car parks that aren't often used. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're not used at all at the moment, but even before COVID, a lot of those car parks were surplus to requirement. Um, there are quite a few plans for Birmingham Airport, which you can't really see on this visual because a lot of them are terminal based. Um, but at the moment, Jaguar Land Rover are also um, expanding at a rate of knots as well, changing their business model towards um, electrical vehicle, electric vehicles. So there are lots of changes in that part. What you can also see to the very bottom of this um, visual is a, a new project that Highways England are delivering. And if you've driven around the area, you'll have seen this yourself with some of the signage and changes to the roads, but there is a new junction 5A, which is between six, which is the very busy junction for the NEC and the airport, and then five, which is further south on the M42 for Solihull Town Centre and Knoll. Um, and that road really will help support all of the planned growth that, that we um, envisage at the hub over the, the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, if you wouldn't mind moving on, please, Grace. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just give you an idea really of the scale of this project, a, a bit like Michael, a, a few big statistics always help bring home just the, the size and the scale of something that you're working on. Um, we think that the environment that we're creating at the hub within that sort of red line map that you saw before is going to support in the region of 70,000 jobs and that's a combination of new and existing jobs and jobs in related supply chains. Um, we anticipate that probably up to 5,000 new homes um, prob probably not homes as in detached houses with gardens, but certainly, um, you know, residential flats, apartments, that sort of living. And then really to, to put um, a sense of reality, if you like, onto the, the amount of commercial space that's going to be available. If, if you bundle together Birmingham city centres, Paradise, Arena Central and Brindley Place schemes, we have got a commercial space offering that's going to be bigger than all of those combined. So that really starts to bring home just how big this project is. 
Um, and what it will deliver is a whole load of GVA. Um, it's it's going to be a bigger GVA than somewhere like a big city like Southampton, which again really starts to bring home the, the opportunity that we've got here to really put the borough on the map. And we're talking about net additional growth as well. This isn't sort of moving around the deck chairs and trying to attract businesses in from Birmingham or Coventry or Nottingham. This is about attracting new international businesses in. So it's all net additional growth that, that we're looking at. Um, and then the final deliverable really that probably makes the biggest difference to people on a day-to-day -day basis is the connectivity. So as much as HS2 is a, a brilliant scheme in terms of, of doing that north-south connectivity, what it does for us is it allows us to build a whole other layer of regional connectivity that isn't brilliant at the moment, if we're perfectly honest. You know, accessing the airport and the NEC is okay if you're just using the West Coast Main Line, but it's very difficult to access in any other way than a car. So we think by the time we've put in these projects and the related um, local public transport connectivity, we're going to have 1.3 million people who are going to be within a 45 minute commute of the hub. And that's on top of the number of people who can get to the hub using HS2. So it's it's a big deal. It's a real game changer for the, for the region. Um, next slide, please, Grace. Thank you. I won't go through these one by one, but I just wanted to make the point that we've, we've got these seven projects that are all related and we do need to deliver them all to deliver the big um, statistics that I've just run through with everybody. I'm going to focus in on a couple of them because I'm pretty sure people don't necessarily want to be um, bored rigid with um, highways. Uh, plans. So if we could move on to the next slide, please, Grace. This, um, this is the, the biggest project, really, that we've got on at the moment. So what you can see here is Arden Cross, the triangle of land with the HS2 interchange station at the heart of it. And then in the background, you can see all the other assets that make up the hub. So when HS2 was originally conceived, the idea was that there would be quite a lot of um, surface car parking to support the station. Um, so we have been working very closely with HS2 and lots of other partners regionally and at central government level to try and change that because surface car parks don't deliver jobs or GBA or new homes. So we've managed to, in partnership, agree that we're consolidating all of that surface car parking into multi-storey car parks, which you can see on the sort of right hand side of the, the triangle. Um, that's really important because it frees up a huge amount of land that's very valuable and can be used for high value development to deliver those high value jobs and those residential homes and the, the leisure that all comes with that. So this is a real game changer for us to go from the original idea to, to making Arden Cross a really viable and attractive development opportunity that brings in a significant economic benefit for the borough. Um, if you could move on, please, Grace, to the next slide. Thank you. Um, again, I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but only to say that there is a, a roundabout that's being built over the HS2 line. Um, and it's another collaboration example, really. I wanted to just demonstrate how we're working very closely with HS2. So this roundabout was designed to accommodate the traffic that would be generated by HS2. But when we looked at it and factored in all of the planned growth that we're looking at as well, that roundabout won't quite cope. Um, so we found some regional money and we're now working with HS2 to design and build in an extra lane on that roundabout that can be opened very quickly when we deliver all the extra planned growth. So there's an awful lot of future proofing really that's, that's going into the work at the moment. Um, next slide please, Grace. Birmingham International Station, I think if you've been through it, you'll know that it's maybe seen its best. Um, it's, it's looking a bit tired. It's, it's 50 years old. I don't know how it feels, um, but it's, it's past its best. It, it needs a, a, a fresh lease of life, but there's also an opportunity to turn it into something much more than just a train station on the West Coast Main Line. So the perspective that you can see on this image here is as you would drive in at the moment where you can see those buses and trams with the, the railway line to the right, that's where you currently drive in. So we're looking at creating a multimodal transport exchange here where you can have metro trams, sprint buses, normal buses, taxis, bicycles, pedestrians, the West Coast main line, all bringing you in, connecting you to the airport, connecting you to the NEC. And then with the next slide, please, Grace, there is a golden thread that will run through the entire site and that's the automated people mover. I think probably most people are familiar with the monorail 
as it's called, that runs from Birmingham Airport to Birmingham International. And what we're looking at here with HS2 is a people mover that goes all the way from that HS2 station at Arden Cross with a stop at the NEC, a stop at Birmingham International and a stop at the airport. And that will run backwards and forwards. Um, it's, it's, an, it's just a, a critical piece of infrastructure to make the whole site much, much better connected. So it's another partnership um, project that we're doing with HS2 and we're looking at a realignment of it so that we can create this big public plaza, a nice piece of public realm, because that in itself opens up all sorts of commercial development opportunities. So we're looking at the possibility of a hotel, some grade A office space, possibly another car park to replace the surface car parking that we're taking away. Um, I won't go on to the other slides, if you don't mind, Grace, because they're, they're not necessarily the most exciting, but I'll mention them just by name. Um, we're looking at a public transport bridge over the M42, because as a motorway, you can imagine how it severs Arden Cross from the rest of the site. Uh, we're also working very closely with our colleagues in council to address some of the, the pinch points on the local highways network. And then the final very important project is, is looking at the electricity network. Um, there's a lot more electricity use <laughs> planned. And the last thing we need is for lights to start flickering. So there's a lot of work there to make sure that we future proof the entire site so that we can deliver these benefits that we, we see in the future. And, and that's everything from me. Thanks, Raj. Thank you, Claire. That was a fascinating run through about the work of the, the Urban Growth Company. I think really a good reminder of the wider socioeconomic benefits that your work will bring, not just for the residents of Solihull, but the West Middleton and beyond. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. Okay, could I now bring in Alison, please? Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me along to speak today about um, Solihull's plans for the Commonwealth Games. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Louise uh, Baggett, who's the project manager at Solihull. And um, in the absence of Nicola, we'll try our best to answer any questions associated with the wider Commonwealth Games. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. 412 days left to go or uh, only 58 Mondays or just over a year. Whichever way you look at it, the clock is counting down to the Commonwealth Games. And this is a very, very exciting time for the region and specifically for Solihull. Um, it is a real opportunity for Solihull to be showcased to the world. And the Commonwealth Games will reach a global audience, TV audience of 1.5 billion. Six of the games are actually taking place at the NEC, so within Solihull as a host authority. We work close with the organising committee and the other venues around the region uh, to prepare for the games. We've established a project team that meets regularly and we have eight work streams. Five of those work streams support delivering the infrastructure of the games. That's around making our roads, our public realm um, look the best it possibly can. We also have issues around trading standards and um, obviously emergency planning. Outside of the infrastructure work streams, we have three work streams focused on the wider impacts of the games and the legacy that we want to deliver from the games, such as volunteering, um, events up to and including the games and increasing sporting activity uh, in the run up to and including the games. It's clearly important to us that we include our communities, businesses, schools in the games and the build up to the games. We want to actively encourage and support people looking for work experience and jobs associated with the Games too. We recently carried out a survey with residents and businesses across Solihull to see what sort of involvement and how involved people wanted to get. There was a real sense of enthusiasm and a willingness and a want to be involved and to make the most of this opportunity. We've also held initial workshop with local businesses to talk about what we can do in terms of events and how do we make the best use of things like Solihull Fest and Solihull Jazz Festival, which both happen around the times of the Games next year. Next slide, please. Uh, following on from Michael and Claire, I'm going to share some statistics with you. These are the statistics of the Games. Um, 43,000 games times roles, as I said, 1.5 billion global TV audience, uh, 11 days of sporting events, 
Um, clearly, uh, the NEC plays a pivotal part because we've got two of the um, athletes' villages are based at the NEC, as well as the number of spectators that we expect to come and visit the area. Um, in addition to the games, um, there is the Queen's Baton Relay. The Queen's Baton Relay will leave from Birmingham Airport this October to travel around the Commonwealth countries. And we're really excited and want to make the most of the opportunity of when it visits Solihull. We're currently um, being advised that the Baton will be in Solihull on the 26th of July. And we want to make sure we maximise that opportunity to showcase Solihull to the world. Um, as well as the sport and the Queen's Baton Relay, there will be a significant opening and closing ceremony that we'll want to get involved in. And again, another opportunity to showcase uh, Solihull in the wider region to the world. In addition to the games, there's a six months culture and arts festival planned, and that will run from March to September. And this ties in with Solihull's ambition to increase its culture and art activity across Solihull, not just for the period of the games, but beginning later this year, starting to build up a year's worth of activity and events that we'll want to continue after the games is over. Next slide, please. The games bring a number of opportunities for the whole region. Specifically for Solihull, we're looking at what that means for Solihull. A key opportunity for us is to build on the opportunity to be showcased to the world, to um, showcase Solihull as a tourist destination. Um, what we are hoping to do is maximise on the visitors that come to the NEC and try and improve connectivity between the NEC and Solihull Town Centre to encourage visitors to come and visit Solihull. We're also looking at how we work with local hotels and how we can support them to attract visitors to come and stay in Solihull. Um, the Games are a real opportunity to aid economic recovery, to support businesses, particularly in our town centres that have struggled over the last 12 months. So we're keen to work with local businesses to make sure that we can support them to help them understand how they can um, make the most of that opportunity. A big part of that is how the town will look. Um, we will be um, dressing the town um, to show that it, the links to the Commonwealth Games and making, as I said, look, it look the best we possibly can. We also want to develop that visitor economy, um, as I said, in, to, to change the perception of Solihull. I suppose at the moment people would say, well, why would I go and visit Solihull? There's only shops and Touchwood. There is a lot to offer in Solihull. We have lots of green spaces. We have lots of lovely parks. We have lots of nice village centres. And we really need to market the borough in a way that people can see that there is a lot to do if they come to Solihull. And we've started to do that with the launch of our Visit Solihull website. Um, key to the games is the number of volunteers that will be required and the employment opportunities it creates. We're keen to make sure that we target these opportunities to the unemployed to give them that real opportunity to go to gain work experience, which will support them into long term employment. Um, the, the Commonwealth Games um, has uh, a Jobs and Skills Academy working across the region with a view to focus on and maximise those employment opportunities. We really want to make sure our communities are involved and support our communities to become stronger, to be very actively involved in the build up to the games and the games themselves. And really, it's about focusing on something other than COVID and giving our community something to look forward to with a range of events that we're planning um, that will be very much local community events. We also want to involve young people and um, those from underrepresented communities in our planned activity across the borough. Um, as I said, um, we want to maximise the, um, the Queen's Baton uh, relay when it travels through Solihull and we're currently uh, working with the organising committee on how we make the best of that. Um, I remember vividly when the Olympic torch visited Solihull, it came at seven o'clock in the morning. Thousands of people turned out to watch it travel through Solihull. Uh, a lot of them made their way into Solihull Town Centre for breakfast, but then they all just gradually disappeared. And it was a real missed opportunity to make the most of those visitors into the borough. So we need to make sure we don't miss that opportunity next time. Next slide, please. Um, Key to us um, as a legacy from the Games is the long-term employment and skills opportunity it provides for people. Um, 
I would strongly advise anybody who's interested in the Commonwealth Games to sign up to the Commonwealth Games website because you'll find a lot of information there on opportunities that are available. And the volunteering website um, was launched this week, so they're keen to sign up volunteers. Again, in terms of statistics, 13,000 volunteering posts to fill, um, a requirement to recruit over a thousand people to deliver the games themselves. And um, as I mentioned, the West Midlands Combined Authority has allocated funding to the Jobs and Skills Academy to support the West Midlands residents over 19 and older in starting new careers um, and work opportunities. Uh, there is a number of courses being offered by the Skills Academy um, and there is a total investment of 1.1 million being provided for that. Next slide, please. Uh, key dates, uh, some of these have passed. Um, the, the first one around the Queen's Batten uh, route negotiations, that has been delayed. Um, we don't have the specifics of where the route is, but we have requested that the, the baton travels through the whole of Solihull, ideally going north to south, south to north. But we're very keen that it passes the NEC and the airport because we are keen to position Solihull in people's minds. Um, as everybody talks about Birmingham Airport and Birmingham NEC, when they're both in Solihull, it's important to us that we make sure that people can see that. Um, lots of other things planned. Um, you'll have seen the launch of uh, Perry the Bull, who's the game's mascot. Um, we have got the opportunity for Perry to visit the borough and we are looking at events over the next 12 months where we can get Perry to come along, meet local people and for children to have opportunities to have photographs taken with Perry. Um, as I said, the volunteer application period has just started and a lot of activity planned for later in the year around the opening closing ceremony and the culture and art ceremonies. And as I said, we will be waving off the Queen's Baton Relay from Birmingham Airport this October and the Commonwealth Games then will take place uh, 28th of July to the 8th of August next year. Next slide, please. Um, this slide um, sets out uh, the, the legacy intentions from both the Commonwealth Games themselves and the local legacy that we're looking for in Solihull. A lasting legacy for the Games is really important to us, um, particularly around our aims to improve tourism, generate um, investment and interest in the region, build that stronger relationship with our communities. Um, and uh, as I say, Nicola would have gone into more detail of the wider uh, legacy objectives, but the objectives for Solihull are, um, as I say, listed on the slide, what we're aiming for, clearly around volunteering, uh, promotion of the borough, improving health and wellbeing and bringing people together. Uh, we are pulling together um, a, a financial investment plan that can look how we can support our planned activity. Uh, we've already secured some funding to support the development of culture and art and volunteering opportunities. And one of the key things that you'll start to see, hopefully quite soon, is a new marketing strategy and how we start to market Solihull both in the region and across the world. Um, we're also pulling together an events timetable and would encourage anyone planning an event in the next 12 months to get in touch with us so we can see how we can involve the, the Commonwealth Games. Um, we might be able to get Perry the Bull to turn up, um, but I absolutely want to look to how we increase access to sporting opportunities as well. So if there are any sports clubs looking to do any activity or events, um, please get in touch with us because we'd love to work with you and how we open them up to wider community to get involved in them. Next slide, please. Um, this slide sets out those legacy outcomes for Solihull, help the region to grow and succeed, looking at how we attract external funding to support culture and sport across the borough, create opportunities for Solihull, um, for local artists and to increase that, that sense of activity in Solihull. Uh, again, put us on the global, global stage, um, aiming for at least 5,000 people to be in attendance with the Queen's Baton Relay, but again, it's about showcasing Solihull to the world. Um, the, the Queen's Baton Relay will be televised. We need to make sure Solihull looks its best uh, and make the most of that opportunity. Um, improving health and well-being, physical activity within the games obviously is, is a key part of the games, but we want to increase the um, interest and involvement in our communities in increasing their physical activity, and that will be around lots of events across the, across the borough. 
Um, and finally, an opportunity really, one for our communities to get excited about and to bring people together and, and to have something that we can focus on and look forward to uh, at the end of what seems a very long dark tunnel that's been COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we are very hopeful that we will be able to really celebrate and enjoy the Commonwealth Games. So thank you. Thank you, Alison, that was great. Um, and I think what's really fascinating for me is from all three uh, presentations, the, the overarching objectives around embedding that legacy culture, tackling those structural gaps which blight our economic um, output as well and thinking about how we can help uh, young people moving forward who as we know have been particularly affected when it comes to their employment prospects as a result of the pandemic. Right so we've got around 10 minutes or so for questions um, and if anyone wants to leave a question or ask a question please do post it in the the Q&A uh, chat box but um, what I'll probably do is just go around each of the, um, the speakers individually and ask one quick question each. So, Michael, if we, if we begin with yourself, I mean, in your experience, I mean, what do you think is the, the biggest challenges that you face in engaging with the SME community on projects of that scale? I think very openly, Raj, it's making, making our access to our world straightforward, using plain English and words of one syllable and, and actually not creating complicated, cluttered, awkward things that prevent people getting access or leave people feeling frustrated. So I think these engagements and engagements beyond, particularly the more local ones at, at a round table level and beyond other things that will help um, to encourage and um, enable SMEs to access our world rather than to effectively spook them or scare them by virtue of, of, of just the complexity of trying to actually um, connect with us so that's really the objective and it's a philosophy I hold generally in everything that we do about you know words of one simple uh, ones of one syllable plain English making things easy and and trying to simplify things yeah it makes sense I mean I, I mean have you found that engagement process has become more difficult throughout the COVID-19 pandemic has it in some ways accelerated that that ability to kind of simplify the agenda and make it clear to cut through I think it's done a bit of both. Um, initially, we we're all finding our feet, and that's true of all of us, but um, what we've been able to do through the process is to get much better at using technology to enable um, us to reach a much wider church of people much more quickly and to do it in a very consistent and a very simple way. Um, and there's always a place absolutely for face-to-face -face conversations as much as we can, but there are times when we the ability to accelerate information and to accelerate it out on a consistent level uh, is very powerful. So. In terms of where we land now, I think we've learnt our way through the, the pandemic and I think we're now better at being able to engage um, with those key messages at the right time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Claire, I mean, I was going to ask you, you touched upon the um, the, the work you're doing on the, the energy scheme, but could you just shed some more light on the work that the Urban Growth Company is doing to support the sustainability agenda? Yeah, of course. I mean, essentially, I'd say a good 75% of the projects that we're working on have a public transport element to them. So I've majored on the, the work that we're doing at Birmingham International Station to turn that into a, a public transport um, facility. Um, that makes a big, big contribution to the, you know, the carbon challenge that we're all facing. So that, that really is at the heart of what we're trying to do. Um, but yes, the energy network is important. We need to work out how to, to create clean energy. And that's a project that, as I mentioned, is underway. Um, but a lot of the work that we're doing is being captured in a sustainability um, strategy that we're hoping to publish in the next month. So if people want to look in on our website, they'll find that on there. But I think probably something that links to a little bit to what you were talking about before in terms of sustainability for us, it's not just about necessarily the environmental sustainability, which is clearly critical but it is about the social sustainability as well so with the contracts that we're due to let ourselves um, there is a big element of, of the criteria in there that is linked to delivering social value so whether that's going in and running sessions with local schools or helping people um, upskill there's a whole spectrum of ways in which the work that we're doing can benefit those communities so I think it's sustainability in, in two different ways and, and that's what we're trying to make a, a big difference with. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, and I guess, Michael, that's the sustainability piece is absolutely huge for, for BBV as well moving forward. Yeah, completely um, at all levels, whether it be sustainability at a, an environmental carbon emission level or sustainability right through to um, 
fulfilling a, a much longer term um, 2050 zero carbon outcome. It applies at every single level of what we do. And um, we, we try to always take a holistic view across all aspects of our activity. That sounds good. So, Alison, my, my question for you really was, what do you think we can learn from uh, games that have taken place in the past, say, for example, in Glasgow and the Gold Coast and embedding that legacy element? And what did they do really well to ensure that that socioeconomic uh, kind of legacy aspect was there once the games had, had come to an end? I think it's one of the things that we're really keen to lean, learn from the people who were involved in Glasgow and the Gold Coast and they have key members on the Commonwealth Games organising committee who were involved in that. Um, we, we're still trying to understand what it is we can do and how do we learn from things that didn't work as well as things that worked well. Mm -hmm. um, for us, in terms of my role in this for Solihull, it's very much about how we improve um, activity and involvement with our local communities, how this is seen as a community um, games for Solihull, that they feel part of it, um, as well as clearly the employment opportunities. But for us, it's about increasing that involvement in sport generally. Um, so yeah, there is a lot for us to learn clearly from what's gone before. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't really say any more than that at the moment, we, we, but we are working with the experts. <laughs> Oh, very much so. And again, obviously, if there's anything that as a chamber that we can do mm. and in terms of not only and again, this is for all for all the speakers on, on the call in terms of showcasing opportunities, uh, making our members aware of how they can get involved in these various projects. And of course, we're we're here to help. Um, I mean, we've got around about five minutes or so left. So I guess just one final uh, point from each of our speakers. But if there's one thing that you want to leave with our uh, audience today, one final message, what would that be? Michael, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've used the phrase earlier about being welcomed by our presence, not noted by our absence. Um, you know, people will have perceptions, I'm sure, of, um, of Balfour, BT, Vinci, us combined and High Speed 2. And I'm very grateful for the support we received from the Chamber and other key stakeholders to the programme as a whole. Um, but at the same time, what I, would, what I would ask, please, is that people can take, um, hopefully from my lead this morning, the fact that we are human. Um, we actually are here to do the very best um, that we can do in the, in the least disruptive way um, to leave a lasting legacy that I think we would all agree that probably beyond my lifetime and some of ours in 50 years time, people will look back and say, well, it was obvious, wasn't it? Why we needed to do that. So the, the human touch and, and the sense of we really do care and uh, being a good neighbor is so front of mind for me because if we can do that, then I think we have a really good um, chance of being successful in all of our endeavors. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Claire, over to you. Yeah, if there was one thing I'd say to um, people who are, are part of this festival of business, it's don't go, don't go, don't move house, don't move your business elsewhere, stay here, invest in this area because in 15 years time, it will be unrecognisable and only in a positive way. So if you want to be a part of that journey and to realise some of those long-term benefits, now is the time to be investing or you know relocating your business to Sally Hall if you're not already in it. So yes, my, my one thing is don't go anywhere. <laughs> and Alison, over to you. Okay. Well, for me, I would say that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to showcase Solly Hull. Um, the phrase that we use is it's Solly Hull's opportunity to wave to the world and we need to make the most of it. What I would say is our plans are still developing and if anybody listening to this is keen to be involved or wants to know more or wants to know how they can help, then I would really encourage them to get in touch with myself or Louise uh, and uh, as I say, anything that, that people feel that they can contribute towards it would be most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think we've, we've had one message in the, uh, the, the, the chat box from uh, Cian Dillon from St. Basil's Charity um, saying that uh, we'd be keen to have conversations to explore how the most vulnerable young people of our region can have access to these opportunities. Having around 550 young people being accommodated in our services within these key areas with many seeking employment, we'd be keen to speak with the most appropriate people to maximise these opportunities. Um, so would it be possible to, we've got Sian's left her details there, to put um, Sian in touch with yourselves and perhaps have a follow-up conversation with the, the relevant person at your organisation? Absolutely, yeah. from my perspective, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I think that's 
everything from us in case anyone else has got any final questions or final points they'd like to make. Um, no, I don't think so. Well, that, all that's left for me to say is, look, thank you so much to all of our, uh, our panellists, to Michael, to Claire and to Alison. Um, again, from our perspective, this is part of our wider uh, Festival of Business series, which is going on throughout the, the, the rest of the month. So please do keep an eye on our uh, website to see which other events are coming up in the next few weeks. I know a couple of weeks from now, uh, we are culminating with our uh, Global Trade Conference, which again, lots of fascinating insight from businesses in the region uh, for those exporting overseas and, want, and offering advice on those local firms who are keen to expand their overseas reach. So again, please do have a look at our website uh, for more information. Um, all again is left for me to say is again, thank you to all of our audience members for joining us today. Thank you to our um, sponsors, Aston University and Leap IT. And again, all that is, again, I'd say is look, you know, if there's any information you'd like, any further uh, contact, please get in touch with ourselves at the chamber. We can put you in touch with the relevant contacts that we've got here on the call today as well. And yeah, have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you, take care. Thank you. Thank you.